The operator of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant has admitted for the first time that contaminated groundwater is seeping from the site into the ocean. The statement comes two weeks after workers recorded a spike in levels of cesium and other substances in monitoring wells near the plant. The first signs of increasing concentrations of radioactive materials were reported in May. In early July, levels of cesium jumped by about 100 times over the space of four days. At the time, officials at Tokyo Electric Power Company said they didn't have enough data to determine if contaminated groundwater was leaking into the ocean. But nuclear regulators contradicted this assessment, saying a leak was highly likely. TEPCO engineers analyzed the levels of groundwater inside monitoring wells between January and July. They concluded that a drop of those levels indicates contaminated water is leaking into the ocean. We sincerely apologize for causing concerns to so many people, particularly those who live in Fukushima. Utility officials say levels of another radioactive substance called tritium have been rising inside the facility's port, but they say the impact of the leak is limited because concentrations of tritium remain low at the port's exit and off the coast. The head of a local fishermen's union says he was shocked to learn the situation is so different from what the utility has been claiming until now. Now, if you ask people in Japan to list the issues that will be on the top of their minds when they go to the polls, many will mention energy policy. The future of nuclear power has been a matter of public debate since 2011 when an accident crippled a plant in Fukushima. Eventually, all of Japan's 50 commercial reactors were offline. Citizens launched demonstrations last year against a decision to restart two units. But since then, the passion for protests has faded. NHK World's Yochiro Tateiwa went to find out why. The aftermath of the 2011 nuclear accident prompted protests after protests against atomic energy and plans to restart idle reactors. Sometimes thousands of people gather, sometimes hundreds of thousands. Tatsuya Yoshioka organized some of the demonstrations. He was thrilled people showed so much passion. More than 60% of the Japanese people, the, especially this uh, civil society opinion, is very strong to, against the nuclear power plants. But month by month, Yoshioka watched their passion fade as people shifted their focus to other issues. Reconstruction from the disaster is much more important than the nuclear issue. Nuclear plants are a complex issue because there are so many points of view. I don't have an instant opinion. I would like to see nuclear power plants restart. Electric bills are too expensive. Yoshioka is trying to reignite a nationwide discussion about the use of nuclear energy. We lose opportunity then really to shift the, our society toward to the nuclear power free. 
Yoshioka says he's frustrated. Japanese seem to have forgotten about the risks nuclear plants pose. Without nuclear power, utility companies are importing more oil and gas. They've started to pass those costs on to their customers. They've been pushing to restart reactors. So have the executives of big corporations. They say Japan needs a stable energy source. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and his ruling Liberal Democratic Party have been making the same argument. They support the nuclear industry, provided it's well regulated. Nuclear power plants that meet new safety requirements shall be restarted in accordance with professional judgment. Leaders of opposition parties all say they want to abolish nuclear energy in the future, but so far they've failed to present concrete ways of achieving it. The Fukushima accident exposed the risks and the expense associated with nuclear power. But Yoshioka says Japanese have become complacent. Day by day, that uh, the memory of the or impression of the March 11th is uh, going bad. The UTT company have started the process of restarting their nuclear power plants. But we must not let the memories of March 11, 2011 fade. Regardless of our personal views on nuclear energy, it's clear that more debates on how to power the country is essential. Now the Prime Minister Abe has gained the power to push through legislation and to implement policies. The question is, how will he use that power? We got some insight from Ken Hijino, an associate professor at Keio University and an expert on Japanese politics. <laughs> So last night's election result completes the LDP's return to power. It now has control of both chambers of the Diet, which means that this problem of Diet twist, in which the ruling party only controls one of the houses, resulting in legislative gridlock, is resolved. At the same time, uh, the LDP has become a very large power, and they're safely in power in a sense. And this may create the risk of infaction uh, infighting and factionalism, which has tended to harm the LDP historically. If Abe -san, uh, Prime Minister Abe is serious about growing, he will also have to, in he will also have to invest uh, in educating the workforce, uh, education, and also getting women to enter the workforce and stay in the workforce. Um, it's often said that Japan's most underused resource or asset is women. If they're serious about long-term growth, then one has to educate the workforce to be able to deal with a new uh, economic environment. Um, so where is the Abe administration spending on? Um, actually, they're spending quite a lot on public works. It's not quite clear whether all that spending is done in the most efficient manner. Uh, as you may know, LDP in the 80s and 90s was notorious for spending on public works, so-called uh, bridges to nowhere, highways to nowhere. If that sort of thing is, were to be repeated, um, although Prime Minister Abe said the LDP is new now, it has, it's a new reformist party, um, there will be a lot of doubts. <laughs> TPP is always discussed or usually discussed in the context of free trade, improving economies, structural reforms, but it has a lot to do with the security architecture in the region. Um, by creating a network a camp of free market liberal democracies through TPP. Uh, I think the intention of the U.S. is to try and engage China, China come into the TPP as well, ultimately. If so, if the Abe administration, because of backbench, backbench resistance, resistance from rank and file, fails to enter the TPP, this will not be uh, damaging just to Japan's economic reform prospects, but also to its security prospects. Ken Hijino, Associate Professor at Keio University.
The operators of four Japanese power companies are trying to get idle nuclear plants up and running again. They've held their first meetings with regulators in charge of screening applications to restart the facilities. The utilities are seeking approval to fire up a total of 12 reactors under new safety standards that took effect last week. Two of those reactors are at Kyushu Electric Sendai plant in Kagoshima. Kyushu Electric officials told members of the Nuclear Regulation Authority about new safety measures at the plant. They discussed preparations for earthquakes and tsunami waves and explained plans for a temporary command center for emergencies. The Sendai plant is near several active volcanoes. Regulators said they need to check whether the plant would be vulnerable in the event of an eruption. Representatives from Hokkaido, Shikoku and Kansai Electric also explained the steps they have taken to increase safety at their facilities. Japanese investigators are taking a closer look at several of the nation's nuclear plants. They're trying to find out if the land beneath them is prone to earthquakes. A team of experts appointed by the Nuclear Regulation Authority is investigating the Monju plant near the Sea of Japan. The fast breeder reactor is designed to generate power using plutonium from spent nuclear fuel. It's currently idle. Monju sits about eight geological faults. Investigators are trying to determine if any of them are active. If they are, regulators won't allow the facility to restart. The team began looking at an area where part of a fault is visible in the ground. They scraped the soil to get a better view. The Monju plant reached criticality in 1994, but shortly after that, a series of accidents and technical problems forced operators to take it offline. The facility has been mostly idle since then. Regulators have ordered investigations into five other nuclear facilities. In May, they determined that a fault beneath the Tsuruga plant is active. A group of protesters in southern China has taken on big business and won. They've succeeded in getting a local government in Guangdong province to drop plans to build a nuclear fuel processing plant. Officials in Jiangmen City have announced that they will not approve an application for the project. More than 1,000 people rallied against the plan on Friday in front of the local government office. Earlier this month, the authorities announced that a state-run corporation would build a nuclear fuel processing facility about 30 kilometers from the city center. The protesters said an accident at the facility could lead to widespread radioactive contamination. India's Supreme Court may have given the final nod to the commissioning of the country's largest power plant, but the move hasn't come. The scandal surrounding it. The station has split locals into those who um, can't claim it's crucial for the economy and those insisting it's a major health hazard. Artis Alexei Rashevsky has been investigating what's driving the anti-nuclear camp. 
This may have seemed as a minor peaceful protest, but it seriously stalled one of India's most ambitious projects. The first energy block of the Kudankulam nuclear power station, destined to solve a growing electricity problem for millions, was due to be launched in 2011. But because of these fishermen protesting against what they see as an environmental threat, India's High Court refused.